You're listening to Voice Actor Showcase, episode number 11. Hi everyone and welcome back to Voice Actor Showcase, a podcast about voice actors and their stories. I'm Jun Yoon. Connect with us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Voice Actor Show. These episodes are also available on YouTube, youtube.com slash voicemoto. The Voice Actor Showcase is about the voice actors on their journey to realize the dream of becoming an established voice actor. We're interested in telling the stories of countless voice actors around the world who are working hard to make their dream a reality. Whether that means they've only learned about punch and roll just yesterday or signed their 20th royalty share contract on ACX. Now, if you have an interesting story to tell, and you just received a now back-ordered Stellar X2 microphone in the mail today, I'd love to have you on the show. Please contact us by visiting voiceactorshowcase.com. Today, we'll meet a voice actor from Dallas, Texas. Originally from Lafayette, Indiana, he made the heavy decision to pursue his VO career rather than the college option. Since then, he's experienced difficult hardships that life threw at him, but with tenacity and determination, he pushed forward. Now living with his girlfriend in Dallas, Texas, he works as an audiobook narrator and a part-time IT professional. We'll hear about his beginnings in Lafayette, about his decision to move to Dallas, and where he plans to go from here. Please welcome Henry Schrader. Activating the main viewing screen shows Zira and Roger trotting down the main corridor to the bridge. D4 barks into the ship's intercom system. Humans, continue on your present path to the bridge to join your friends, or I will be forced to kill all of them. You have two minutes to get here. Just as their time is about to expire, Zira and Roger, breathless, rush out of the elevator onto the bridge. Seeing the firearms pointed at their friends' heads, they immediately surrender their weapons, offering no resistance. Tied up, too, they join their compatriots on the floor. A voice message from the PAM comes through the comm system. Helvik, our sensors show that you are approaching our sun. What is the meaning of this? The meaning? My meaning should be quite clear. I'm about to kill everyone and everything in this solar system. Minister, you will have thirty days before your home star explodes. If I were you, I'd board the fastest ship you can find. All right, Henry Schrader. Hello, sir. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's good to be <laughs> here. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, let's just get right into it, shall we? Um, All right. You know, deciding to pursue a VO career instead of going to college must have been a really difficult decision, was it? Talk to us about the time in your life and how you ended up deciding to pursue VO instead of a college degree. Well, it sounds like the kind of thing that people would wrestle with. Um, but in my case, I really wasn't good at anything that you would go to college for. So for me, it was a pretty simple decision because, you know, my mom was saying like, well, you should go, you should have something as a backup, you should whatever. The only other thing I was good at in school was writing, and there's really nothing you can do with a writing degree that you can't without. Huh. So I decided, you know, if I'm going to go into this, I might as well take the time and not spend the money to get a degree that won't probably help me in the long run anyway. Hmm. I guess it's a smart choice. I mean, uh, would you consider yourself lucky for finding your passion, if you will, for VO that early on? I would definitely say that I'm glad I found it before I started college. Mm. Because I know there's that's a big thing for a lot of people. They start and they get halfway through their degree and they go, Ah, you know what? I really don't like majoring in engineering, <laughs> but at that point, they've already sunk so much into it, you know, they got to follow it through. It's just not something I felt comfortable doing, which is weird because people always say like, oh, you know, it's the safe thing to do. But for me, I always looked at it as the dangerous option. Oh. Um, but yeah, I, I tried writing in high school. Uh, because I consider that potentially a career option I would choose. Yeah. But after I wrote a book, uh, I decided it was not something I wanted to do for a living. And I'd always thought about voice acting as a 
you know, a cool idea for a career, but I didn't really think about pursuing it until late in high school. How did you come to the realization that voiceover could be a career? Well, I see other people doing it and they're successful. Why can't I? Is there any childhood story that, that are attached to this? Uh, there's not a particular story, but I did grow up watching... Um, Naruto was my first oh, like anime that I nice. watched. And that's what made me really pay attention to voice acting. Because when you're a kid, you watch, you know, Spongebob or Fairly Odd Parents or whatever. And there's voice actors in it, but mm -hmm. you don't really think about it as a kid. You're just, ah, it's, it's the cartoon. I like it, whatever. So for me, it was watching something where there were like real high stakes and stuff like that. Hmm. And then I branched out into watching other anime and I started noticing the same couple of people popping up and I was like, hey, that's one guy doing all those voices. That's like, that's his job. So I think that's kind of what made me realize, like, this is something that people do for a living. With the experience of growing up with anime and discovering voiceover, what is your current favorite anime title? Oof. Um, or, do you, or do you still watch? I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I do. Uh, I think currently, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, but the one title that I would recommend to anyone to watch would probably be Hajime no Ippo. I was a, uh, I was kind of the centerpiece for the rest of my friends to start watching anime. So ah. most of them have the same tastes I do because I told them to go watch stuff. You're that guy. You're the anime guy. Yeah, with all that <laughs> comes with that. That's great. I love anime talk, and I'll do it every day. You briefly mentioned something about lungs collapsing. That doesn't sound very pleasant. Tell me the story there. Well, the funny thing is, so it happened to me twice, which that's not the funny thing. That sucks. <laughs> but uh, the first time, I didn't even know that it happened, because... It was a spontaneous lung collapse, which is apparently pretty common if Whoa. you're shaped like I am. Like, for reference, I'm 6'4 and 180 pounds, but I am the fattest I've ever been right now. Oh, my goodness. And when I was in high school, I was basically this tall. I was, like, maybe two inches shorter, and I weighed 145. Wow. Like, it sounds like someone who has an eating disorder, but I was, it just, my metabolism was so fast. Like, it was crazy. I just imagine Larry Bird, actually, just <laughs> tall and skinny. <laughs> yeah, and from Indiana, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so I, I woke up, it was a school day, and I went to school, and I was kind of like, ah, man, my, my arm kind of hurts a little, like, when you sleep on it, and it's, like, just kind of tweaked the rest of the day. It felt like that, but kind of like behind my shoulder blade. Oh. And so I was sitting in class and it just kept getting like more and more painful. And I was like, something doesn't feel right. Yeah. And I noticed like, oh, you know, it only hurts when I'm breathing in. So, oh, no. yeah, I I called my mom after first period and I was like, Hey, uh, I should probably, like, go to urgent care or something. Yeah. And she, at first, thought I was trying to, like, skip class because uh, there was a big announcement for the new SSX game that was coming out, and I was very excited for it. <laughs> so, yeah, she would, we were in the car, and she was like, Okay, if you just wanted to stay home... Tell me now, oh, because no. I don't want to waste the money on a doctor. <laughs> oh, like, no. <laughs> well, uh, as much as I would like to say that, no, I think I need a doctor. <laughs> so we go in and we're expecting like, oh, you have an infection or pneumonia or whatever. Yeah. And the doctor was this young 
Indian guy, and he was like, okay, so what we have here is uh, your lung has collapsed. And we were both like, what? <laughs> what do you mean it's collapsed? How did this happen? And he was like, well, uh, do you smoke? And I was like, no. And he was like, okay. Uh, have you had any blunt force trauma recently? And I'm like, <laughs> no. Uh, surprisingly not. <laughs> and he was like, okay, well, sometimes it just happens. Oh my gosh. Which, at the time, I was like, oh, okay. What? But then later, <laughs> thinking about it, I was like, man, that's nonsense. What do you mean it just happens? <laughs> it just happens? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, how it eventually got explained to me, because after he was explaining, he used his hands a lot, and he was explaining, like, sometimes it happens when a rib breaks and, like, punctures the lung and he like did a snapping motion with his hands like he was breaking a stick and something about that made me feel really nauseous and I passed out for a minute but whoa uh, afterwards he explained like yeah if you're really tall and really skinny uh, as a teenage boy that just can happen where like your lungs are growing so quickly with your chest that they just get stretched out and just pop off the wall of your chest, essentially. Oh my gosh. Like I said, he was a young doctor, so he was really like, let's get it done, let's do the surgery, let's, you know, whatever. Yeah. So like a week later, I went into surgery for it, and I spent a week in the hospital with a chest tube, and that was a fairly miserable experience. Just, like, you don't think about not being able to roll over onto your side to sleep oh. until it's not an option. I'm a side sleeper. I know. <laughs> exactly. Me too. Like, I'm I'm always on either my left or my right. I mm -hmm. never sleep on my back unless I'm, like, sick and sitting up. Wow. So, yeah, that there was that. I discovered that I don't like Oxycontin or morphine. Which is probably a good thing, knowing how addictive they are. Yeah. But yeah, they it it just didn't feel like it helped that much with the pain. Oh, man. So I was in the hospital for a week of recovery. And then I got sent home. They pulled out the chest tube, which they do while you're awake. Oh, um, gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot worse than it was, because at that point, you're so, like, I don't know if they use, like, a numbing agent or whatever, but, like, I couldn't feel my chest on that side for a year or so after the surgery. Oh, um, wow. So when they were pulling it out, I didn't even feel it, but, yeah, they, like, it's like watching someone, like, pull a lawnmower cord. Like, they oh. they rip it. <laughs> And like it doesn't look very medical when you when you see it. So that was the first time. I wanted to go look at some YouTube videos of that yeah. happening. That was the first time of two. Yep, happened again two years later on the other side. Wow. So uh, it was largely the same story, except the second time I was awake. And I felt it. And that was, Ugh. that hurt a lot. Ugh. And the doctor I had that time was older. So he was like, we'll play it safe. Just we'll let it sit for a while. Because apparently they can fix themselves oh, wow. sometimes. So I spent like months waiting for it to fix itself before I got surgery to fix it. And uh, the second time around, I didn't need the medicine at all. Like it didn't, it just didn't hurt. And I don't know why, but I felt great the second time. I don't know what it was. I just, like, they were like, okay, we're going to give you your first round of medicine. And I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good for now. I'm I'll, I'll let you know if it starts to hurt. But, like, <laughs> morphine just makes you feel hot from the inside. So I was like, I'm not going to take that if I don't have to. Yeah, I hear you on that one. I don't, I don't like to take medicine if I don't have to. I mean, that's... That's two surgeries, one on each lung. Yep. Um, and this really wasn't that long ago. 
I'm sure you've recovered to a certain extent, but what kind of effect does that have on your ability to perform? Honestly, I don't notice it day to day, and they make you take, like, they give you like a breathalyzer sort of tube to test your breathing before they let you leave the hospital. Mm -hmm. You have to keep it at a certain level with your breath for like 10 seconds with a nurse watching before they let you leave. Huh. So I think they try to be very conscious of letting, like not letting people diminish their own lung capacity a bunch. Right. The only thing that it really affects is occasionally I can feel like where if I shift to a certain way, I can feel like the staples on my lungs Ugh. rubbing against Ugh. my chest. Oh, <laughs> It sounds worse than it is. It doesn't feel too bad, but I noticed that occasionally, and the doctors told me I can never play a brass instrument or uh, go scuba diving. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that doesn't come up that much in daily life, so I can't... Unless you change your mind. Well, yeah, but I mean, I used to play the trumpet, but when they were like, oh, you can't do that anymore, I wasn't like... Oh no, my dream of being a trumpeter. I was kind of like, eh, all right. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I mean, I did find out I can't give blood, like, ever. It's really weird the way they do that, because um, I signed up to give blood, and they were like, yeah, so if you have any medical restrictions at all, you can't give blood. And I was like, well, these are lifelong restrictions, that really aren't that medical. Like, there's just two things I can't do now. And they were like, yeah, but it counts. So thanks for trying. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well. Okay. Bye. I mean, fine. But, but if you wake up one day and you're like, I really want to play the trombone and go scuba diving after lunch, right? what are you going to do? I don't know. Probably play video games or, <laughs> I don't know, do one of my other hobbies. <laughs> I, I guess I'm just, like, a lot more laid back than the average person. My girlfriend heard that, and she was like, you can never go scuba diving? <laughs> and I was like, no, why? <laughs> she was like, aren't you sad? You'll never be able... And I was like, yeah, it's, it's fine, like... I have glasses. Even if I went scuba diving, what would I be able to see underwater? You know, I bet it's that optimistic and, and, and that dry humor, too, that you've got going on there. That's, that's really helped you through it, I bet. I don't know. <laughs> well, I'd like to think that it's good for something. So you moved from Lafayette, Indiana to Dallas, Texas, to pursue voice acting further. Now, when you say Dallas, I think immediately Funimation. Is that why you're there? I mean, that's definitely a big draw. Um, I didn't have a specific plan for where I was going to go. Um, it was just my girlfriend was coming up on the end of college, and I was like, because we started dating her sophomore year late sophomore early junior something like that mm -hmm. so it was pretty much just implied i was like i'll wait here for you and then when we're done when you're done with college i'll move somewhere and you can come with me and so i was trying to do research about it and i found there's only like five major cities where you can do voice acting mm-hmm and all of them cost like a million dollars to live in, except for Dallas. So I was like, all right, Dallas it is. <laughs> it's weird. I don't know. It's not very romantic to say that money was the driving force, but that's really, that's it. It's real life. I mean, <laughs> yeah. who goes to Hollywood you know, with a backpack who jumps on a greyhound yeah. and then starts singing and dancing on the freeway. That doesn't happen in real life. <laughs> I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I can't even sing that well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
you know what? I I really think you should um, branch out into a stand up comedy because you're killing me right now. <laughs> I've thought about it, but I've noticed that I'm not very good at being funny in a void. I need someone else to be setting me up, which is what you are doing wonderfully. So, believe it or not, you're you're doing it by yourself. I am hundreds of miles away in two different time zones. Two different time zones. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I mean, I that's that was that was gonna be my follow up question. Why Dallas instead of L.A., New York, Chicago, so on and so forth? I think money is the right answer. It should be the right answer. Nobody should jump on a bus and just show up in L.A. Yeah. Bad things happen to people like that. You know what I mean? And, you know, everyone has their their star story where it's, oh, you know, I was just in a bar performing for pennies like I always did and then (laughs) <laughs> Suddenly, the owner of this record label, they they turned it around for me. They And then it's, you know, the next big Charlie Puth or whoever. But you don't really hear the stories of the people who are like, yeah, I was performing in a bar for pennies and nothing really changed. And then I was homeless for a while. And then I moved back to Nebraska. Those stories don't make it to Hollywood. That's why, unfortunately. Yeah, they they usually end up on a Hallmark channel, I think. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, but eventual move is in the works, right? For for long term planning, um, unless you hit it really big in the Dallas area, I guess. But eventually, you'll move out to LA. New York, Chicago, right? Well, we've talked about it a lot because, you know, our our family lives back in Lafayette. And if we have kids at some point, we would want them to be somewhat close to their family. And family is very important to both of us. We We grew up in the Midwest where most of your cousins live within like a couple hours of you, Mm. which I don't necessarily need to have all my cousins right there, but like my parents and I don't know, I grew up knowing my grandparents. I would want my kids to be able to do the same. But the other thing of that is there are only a few places where you really can do this stuff. And from what I've heard, once you're like really big, you can kind of do stuff wherever and send it into the big studios, but, you know, of course you have to be at a point where the big studios are willing to do that. Correct. So it's it's a hard thing to decide because right now I'm just doing audiobook stuff, trying to make that the big thing so I can work on the less stable stuff like trying to do funimation or video games or whatever we we talk about it all the time but it's impossible to make a plan with so many variables like if i suddenly become the next big audiobook guy i don't know if i'm gonna want to try and go for these other avenues where i won't be making as much or I might not get any roles or whatever, and I have to be in the same place. Whereas with audiobooks, I can just be wherever, record wherever, and do it that way. I think that the momentum is shifting to a certain degree, I think. Mainly because I've talked to so many people through this podcast who make a really decent living wherever they may be. Michael Goodrick is a good example. The guy is a, he's branded himself as an as an audiobook narrator. Mm-hmm. And he's in he's in Arizona, far far away from LA. Right. Further away from New York, Chicago. He's in Arizona in the middle of nowhere. You know, that, like, no, he's in Gilbert. He's not exactly nowhere, but you get my idea. Right. But he records from his home studio. He's got 80 plus audiobooks under his belt and he's making a killing. So yeah. 
who's to say that you have to go to LA, New York, Chicago nowadays, Atlanta, you know? Yeah. And, you know, when I started doing this, I wasn't setting out to be the audiobook guy. I never even thought about audiobooks. But at this point, like, I've learned that doing a regular job kills me. Mm. So I need to do something else. And even if audiobooks are my main source of income and I never get to do any of the things I started out wishing I could do, I think I could still be pretty happy with it. Hmm. Interesting. Interest. Really interesting perspective. I, and I say this because there are people who, there are diehard audiobook narrators out there. Don't give me commercial. Don't give me e-learning. Don't give me promos. I'm going to do audiobooks because I love it. Right. You're not that person. No, not really. I mean, I like, I like audiobooks. Um, and for a very decent period of time, I just stopped reading, like, books. I, I would read comics, and I would read manga and whatever, but... You know, I was, I'm a big fan of Stephen King's work, but the man writes Bibles, like, <laughs> they're so big. And once it got to the point where I read every book he had under 2,000 pages, I was just kind of like, you know, I want to read something more easily consumable than these tomes. <laughs> so I'm reading more now than I ever did just from virtue of reading other people's books for money. And the bonus of it is I also get to make money in practice. But hmm. it's it's not the thing I pictured myself doing exactly. But, yeah, you know, I part of why I didn't go to college is because I know my own personality... And I knew that if I had a good alternative that wasn't very much work, I would take it. Because mm. my mom suggested, like, go for IT stuff, you know, which, that's a good idea. I would be making a lot more money yeah. if I had. But at the same time, I probably wouldn't be trying voice acting stuff, because why would I bother if I'm already making $60,000 a year right. doing that? And if I want to embark on this journey, I'm going to be starting at scratch, you know? Which, my plan at the time has pretty much completely fallen apart. Nothing has gone the way I thought it would, but that's exactly <laughs> how life is, especially mm -hmm. when you're, like, 18, and you're like, no, nah, I got it all figured out, don't worry. <laughs> Voice acting is easy, I got it. So, luckily she did believe in me in that uh and didn't force me into college but yeah i mean if she knew how things were going to turn out at first i think she would have been like eh, maybe just go to college <laughs> um very lucky that all of my friends and family have been so supportive especially i have to probably shout out my girlfriend because there were months where, after we moved here, I didn't have a job, and she was supporting me. Yeah. And then there were times where she didn't have a job, and I was supporting her by, you know, mm. working at Domino's, which, ha. that's that's a job. And uh, I delivered for Domino's for three yeah. years. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure... I'm sure you are very familiar then. Oh, man. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, that was... Like, I considered that my best job at the time. Uh, but I guess I've just had bad jobs, because she started working there when money became, like, a real tight issue. Yeah. And she was like, oh, my God, you, like, you have to do all this stuff? And I was like, yeah, it's pretty good. She was like... No, this, <laughs> this job is terrible. Why do you like it? It's like, 
What do you mean? It's so much easier than my hospital job. This, like, I'm living the life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, after a while, you grow disillusioned with it. But, yeah, I, I very much have to mention my girlfriend if we're talking about support. Because she moved away from her family to come here with me. Wow. Because she hopefully believes in me. I don't think she would have moved if she didn't believe in you, to be quite honest. And I'm sure she'll agree, too. No, I mean, she she always makes it very clear that she believes in me, but she is also very much a worry type of person. So, <laughs> you know, there are times where I'm like, ah, this month I didn't do so hot on the royalties, and she'll be like, are, are we going to, like lose all of our money is everything and i'm like no it's fine we're like i'm good i'm just letting you know this month i did not do super great <laughs> but next month i should do just fine <laughs> i think i think the two of you make a good team and maybe that's why things are working out maybe not so well per se but things are working out you know what i mean they're doing pretty well now I'm at a point now where I'm not struggling as much, and she got a job not at Domino's. Oh, good. Where she can work steady, like a steady schedule and good pay, and you know, so things are things are better. Like I, before Christmas, I was just trying to make a little bit of extra money to buy presents and stuff, because at that point I still hadn't been doing it for very long and I hadn't been at my other job for very long either so I didn't have very much money but I got a lot of friends and family so I was you know trying to get gifts for everyone yeah and I was like I'll just take some of these informational books like textbooks whatever I narrated three books on economics yes and they were all just the worst to try to read <laughs> because it's so boring. Yeah. <laughs> but I've also read a lot of books that are just genuinely good books that I probably wouldn't have read otherwise. Yeah. Like, most recently, um, I just finished up a book with an author who... She's apparently like a USA Today bestseller. Wow. Um, her name is Carolyn Jordan. And she wrote this book with a co-author who I think is German. His name is like Luger Dominic Brocht. <laughs> and it's this book about a tour group of Europeans who come to America to explore like the great... Um, national parks you oh, know how fun so yeah. yeah so they start out in like las vegas and they make their way from there and the plot thickens as a group of it's two mafia guys who are stationed in las vegas oh, they no. they're trying to get after them and i won't you know spoil why but <laughs> good you know they're these bumbling like incompetent guys who can't figure out the wilderness because they're so used to like Vegas city life. Like, like I would probably never have picked that book up on my own, but through these, uh, contracts, I've been able to read these books and broaden my horizons a little bit. So while it's not exactly what I wanted to do, I'm, I still definitely enjoy it a lot. You know, I looked you up on Audible, on ACX, Amazon's platform, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw a bunch of different uh, titles that you had narrated. I'm really curious whether you had picked up a recipe or two, perhaps, from the electric pressure cooker for beginners. Um, so here's the thing. <laughs> like, I don't... <laughs> do tell, I don't wanna... do tell. I don't, like, I don't want to trash <laughs> oh, no. these people who are, like, trying to give me these. But I just don't know who those are for. Because, like, <laughs> the only thing I could think of is, like, if a blind person was trying to cook. But they're going to need more help than just being able to read the cookbook. 
<laughs> and that one wasn't written too bad. Some of the recipes got repeated a couple of times, but like it was really, it was literally just me being like, soup for one, <laughs> potatoes, <laughs> celery, like there weren't really any that I thought of that I was super into, but it's, it's kind of weird because like I'm pretty picky but I also love food. Yeah. Because originally I I thought like, I just don't like food that much, I guess. No, I love food, <laughs> but I only love a certain sect of food. Mm. And like, I've started branching out more. Um, well, good. My girlfriend like forced me to try a burger once because <laughs> I was like, ah, I had it forever ago. I didn't like it, whatever. And then she was like, just eat it. So I tried it, and I was like, all right, I guess. <laughs> so now I eat burgers, and I've been eating steak, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to branch out on that stuff. I cannot stand poultry at all. I don't like chicken. I don't like turkey. And I don't know what it is about it. It just, it tastes like off to me <laughs> for some reason. Like, it's not right. I don't know. I also found I also see that your YouTube channel has a lot of content. Now, tell me about your YouTube channel. Why is it called a hen house and what kind of content do you have there? The name was actually uh Kearney's idea. That's my girlfriend. Um mm. because my friend Brandon and I we wanted to start a YouTube channel because we were playing games all the time anyway. Might as well record it. Yeah. I was sitting there, I was trying to think of a name, and I was like, I want something catchy. So I was trying to think of something unique to us and whatever, and she was like, well, your name is Henry. How about the Hen House? And I was like, <laughs> hen house. That's, that's it then. <laughs> yep. So, of course, it's all uh, branded with like chicken themed things uh of course my my friend brandon who he does like all the art stuff for it he drew us all as chickens and you know he makes all the thumbnails and whatever so okay real talk would you rather be a voice actor voicing characters and acting or would you rather be a video game streamer that was my original, like, dream job. I was like, oh, man, if I could just do that, that would be so amazing. I think I would probably still choose voice acting over video game stuff just because I get a sense of accomplishment mm. when I, like, when I've got a really solid audition for something, like... When I'm like, yeah, that was, those characters fit the voices I was doing. I, you know, I did well, whatever. And it's nice to be able to, like, show people what you do. Yeah. Whereas there's just some people who will never understand the whole YouTube thing. Like, if I tell my grandparents I'm recording audiobooks, they know what an audiobook is. They've been around forever. Right. But if I tell them, like, yeah, I'm doing YouTube, they're like, what do you do exactly? Like, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's probably, I'd probably still choose voice acting, but it is appealing. Yeah. The idea of just play a game for four hours, cut it up, and let it go. How about some goals for 2020? Personal, professional, both? Hmm. Well, personally, I've always wanted to do a martial art mm. and just start something seriously and start getting good at it and putting on some muscle. Mm. Not because I care that much about having muscle, but more because the doctors told me to gain weight in either muscle or uh, fat and... Well, I have gained some fat. I it's <laughs> not enough probably. I think I'm still like a little bit underweight for my height. So and, you know, hopefully learn some cool stuff while I'm at it. 
Nice. So far, we've done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai, and we went to a place that was doing like Shaolin Kung Fu. Wow. And uh, the Muay Thai is my favorite so far, which like I'm built for it, so maybe I'm just naturally predisposed to like it. But (laughs) uh, as far as career goals go, my realistic goal for this year is to not be working my second job and to transition into audiobooks full time. Wow. Yeah. Okay. My unrealistic goal is do that, but shortly enough in the year, like maybe halfway through the year, start doing the Funimation and, you know, video game stuff that I really want to do. Mm. Because, you know, when you've got two jobs, it's just hard to try to make time for that kind of stuff. Especially as a person who grew up with anime, I, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards pushing you towards uh, Funimation. Yeah, I mean it's something that I've wanted for a long time. I've, I haven't been very specific in what I've really wanted. It just like I thought I could be happy in games or anime or just like American cartoons, you know. Mm. I don't know. I think I could have fun with any of these and feel fulfilled. Well, I wish you nothing but success and and clarity in your path towards that goal. I mean, if you if your happiness comes from audiobooks and your girlfriend and you decide to just settle down and just narrate audiobooks until you turn 85, I think that's perfectly fine too. You know what I mean? As long as you're happy. Yeah. Honestly, as the uh, as the years have gone by, which is a very old thing to say when you're 24, um, <laughs> I've just learned that I like being more expressive and open with people. Like, I mean, you can hear it. I don't have, like, the most bouncy, expressive voice, but in high school... You know, I was tired all the time, so I was monotone for probably 95% of a day, and, you know, it it became like a running joke with people, so I I would play into it, because I thought it was kind of funny, and, you know, at that age, you want people to think you're funny, and you want attention, and whatever, so I played into it, and I became kind of known as the monotone guy who doesn't really care that much about anything. And (laughs) for a while I was happy with that. I was like, yeah, it's whatever. I'm cool. But as I've gotten older, I've found it like kind of hard to just say what I'm feeling sometimes. Like I hate confrontation and my girlfriend and her family are like... (laughs) Oh, no. They... All right, hold on. (laughs) (laughs) Don't let her hear that. (laughs) Well, they know, all right? Like, (laughs) they will fight over anything. And they are very loving people. They have accepted me as one of their own, and, you know, I'm happy to be part of the family. But, like... When I first started hanging out there and people were just yelling at each other, I was like, (laughs) oh my god. Like, why does everyone hate each other so much in this family? Like, what's wrong with you? And my girlfriend was like, what? Oh, that? Like, no, we didn't... No one's even mad about anything anymore. Like, we've not... I was like, okay. So... (sighs) I'm telling you, honestly... There's something about the way you talk that that's I I see it as a marketable property. I really do, because I I really wish that you would explore more into this with a with a VO coach or acting coach of some kind. Because I think there's boundless potential in your monotonic, flat delivery of these side splitting things that you're saying. Oh my gosh, when you are feeling dejected about life. What are you, and you're sitting at the bar, 
What is your order? My go-to drink tends to be a white Russian. Nice. Just, I don't know, I like coffee, and that sufficiently covers the alcohol enough that, like, I don't hate it. Yeah. If, yeah, I mean, that's probably my go-to. And what's next, Henry? What do you have coming up? Uh, where do you go from here in terms of career, future in general? And if the listeners would like to find out more about you and your work, where do they go to find you? Well, as for what's coming next, uh, as I said, I just finished that book. It's called, um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has a name. It's got a title, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the latest book I've done that will be out soon is Breakdown on Blowhard Mountain, A Travel Mystery, A Comical Chase Through the Western National Parks. It's by Carolyn Jordan and Luger Dominic Brocht. And uh, if you're a fan of, like, just kind of, like, nature-y books, Carolyn Jordan apparently does tons of them. Like, those are the books that she was on the USA Today thing for because... Some of them had, like, thousands of reviews on Amazon, and hmm. it's stuff about, like, bear attacks and just general good stuff to know if you're going to be in one of those parks. So you can, you can really tell, like, the knowledge that went into the book. Like, I learned a lot just by reading the book out loud. And nice. It's a, it's a good story on top of that. So that's the next thing. For me, as far as that goes, I've got, you know, a couple more audiobooks that I'm working on right now, but those won't be out for a while. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm always trying to do more of those. Hopefully, uh, soon I'll be able to do something a little more aligned with what I set out to do in the first place, but yeah, for now I'm happy with this and, uh... It's always nice to see people who enjoy audiobooks. If people want to find more of me, they can search Henry Schrader on Audible or Amazon. And if you search Henry Schrader on Amazon, you may also be able to find my book that I wrote a few years back. It's... it's alright, I think, but... <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much what the reviews said. They were like, eh, it's alright. Which, you know, that's fine with me, I guess. Yeah, it's not terrible. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's all right. And I've, I've got a bunch of short stories on my website that I've been thinking of potentially publishing as a collection, mm. uh, maybe through Amazon again. So, yeah, search Henry Schrader on any site where you can buy things and you probably will find me. My website's one of those... It's like one of those Wix websites with a stupid URL... It's a uh, hjschrader 09wixcom slash Henry Schrader. So if anyone out there really wants to type that in, you can go for it. And I've got my projects listed there, and I update it every once in a while to add the new stuff I've done. And, of course, my YouTube channel that we talked about is uh, the Hen House Gaming. Mm -hmm. You can find that just youtube.com slash the hen house gaming so i think that pretty much covers all the stuff that i need to shill excellent typically when i interview voice actors i i have a lot of fun because they're actors we're all actors and we like to talk and that's fine but tonight has been really really entertaining for me so thank you very much i know you weren't intending to be funny but I found you hilarious, so... <laughs> I'm always trying to be a little funny, at least. I feel like if I'm not, I'm going to come off as boring. So, but yeah, I had a really fun time as well. I was, uh, I'm glad to be here, so thank you. Thanks for spending the time. Oh, man, I, I can't wait to let the audience hear this. I, this is going to be a good episode. I can't wait. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. This has been Voice Actor Showcase. Visit our website at voiceactorshowcase.com. If you'd like to be featured on this podcast, contact us at voiceactorshowcase.com. 
Thanks for listening.